Hi, and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television, and in books. And today I'm doing a spoiler chat about uh, Night of Knives by Ian Cameron Esselmont. And I'm joined by my, my colleague, Dr. Philip Chase. Say hello, Philip. Hello, everyone. And Ian Cameron Esselmont. Hello. <laughs> so if, if you uh, haven't already seen it, there is a non-spoiler version uh, on Philip Jace's channel. I will link to it in the description below. But this is a spoiler-filled chat. So uh, if you don't want the, the book spoiled, please look away now, turn the, the, the video off now. We will see you once you have read the book. For everyone else, uh, let's get into it. And you guys may have noticed I took the tie off because this is the relaxed spoiler chat. <laughs> That's appropriate. I oh, like oh, oh. <laughs> Watch out, everybody. The tie's off. <laughs> so um, the, the first thing that I wanted to, to talk about in this, and I had alluded to in um, the, the non-spoiler chat, was the fact that this happens over one night. Like, it, mm. it still boggles my mind that you get an entire novel with everything that happens in it and it happens over one night. So can we talk a little bit, uh, Cameron, can you talk a little bit just about that aspect of it? All right. Well, a slim novel. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I had mentioned this um, at an, an another interview that um, at the time, this is you know way back, much longer than I'd like to think about, um, and at the time, the fantasy genre was, um, whenever anyone actually even bothered to look at it from a critical point of view, they would dismiss it as having no limitations and, and the books having no shape, just just awful bags where everything's thrown in. Uh, and and uh, picaresque sort of adventures that just went on and on forever uh, with no real resolution or change. And, and so I decided one of the things I would address in Night of Nice is that critique. And I would say, oh yeah, well, I can do a fantasy novel that would timeline wise would fit in with modern literal um, standards. So uh, that's one of the tasks that I, I set myself. Um, because the, the piercing in this, if um, just thinking about it in terms of throwing the reader in to a, a brand new world and yet you keep it the location is, with, with minor exceptions, Malaz City. So we get this uh, fantasy city so the reader can become very, very comfortable with the, the setting. So that becomes familiarized over the course of it. And you have two point of view characters, uh, Temper and Kiska. And what I really liked about this is Temper is the, the grizzled veteran, the world weary cynic. And you go, yeah, tick, that, that's a trope. I understand that but he has a very particular worldview. And then you contrast this so well with a, a young female perspective in Kiska, who is uh, not necessarily wide-eyed and uh, some sort of ingenue, like she's, she's quite a perceptive and uh, ambiguous character in some respects. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, uh, but Kiska is ambitious, whereas Temper has seen it, he's been there. And what they both have in common though, is this determination. And uh, I mean, in Temper's case, there's a literal determination where he's this wall, right? I mean, that is his function as he's part of the sword, of uh, Dasan's sword. Uh, it, great stuff there, by the way, these flashbacks. Uh, love how you wove those in there. And you have her, Kiska's determination to get off this island, to you know make a destiny for herself. So they are, I have to agree with AP, just wonderful POV characters who actually never meet. They, there are these wonderful comical moments where she sees him and thinks he's a monster like a couple times because there's a lot of horror elements in here. You can't blame her. One of the monsters, one of the, the many. One of the many that are running amok uh, on this particular night. Uh, it's, it's almost, I had to laugh at that point because I knew who he was at that moment because I had been with him. She didn't know who he was. They never actually meet and yet their stories mesh so nicely to give us this, this wonderful book. Uh, so brilliantly done. 
uh, congratulations on that. And, and uh, you know, in addition, there are just all these so many little things that we have to talk about. Uh, the main narrative begins, I think, with temper. Uh, was talk about the prologues because I think they're beautifully written. In fact, that's what I want to do a close reading of is the very opening. But we'll say that for a bit. But I loved how you started off and ended the main narrative, not the prologue, not the epilogue, with Mock's vein. And in the very beginning, what we have is the there is supposedly no wind, but the vein is going crazy, right? And at the end, you have the opposite. You have uh, a blustery wind, but the vein is like almost like it's rusted, so it's it's not moving. So I thought that was an interesting little message there. Things are on the loose here, maybe in the beginning, like things are happening. This is, we're we're being warned here by Mox Vane that things are uh, about to go a little bit crazy, um, and it, and it's of course Temper who sees it both times. So. Anything I'm missing there with the vein? Is was that a uh, yeah? Oh, no, we're 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 good on that. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. The the <clears throat> uh, possibilities are opening up, and and uh, the as the they, you know the, the saying is the walls between worlds are are thinning, and and uh, anything could happen. Yeah, uh, and this is um, why um, of the two, Kiska's in many ways the more dangerous hmm. because she could go either way. Uh, it, it depends on what happens to her. She could turn, she could join the claw and, and you know, and darken, uh, or she could go the other way in her uh, uh, character. Yeah. So she's un, uh, yet to be formed. Interesting. So, and by the way, um, we are not doing spoilers for the rest of the novels of the Malazan Empire in this video, of course, right? Because we're only talking Night of Knives, just spoilers. Oh, yeah, Knives. Shut me up if I... Uh... <laughs> no, no, not you. Uh, but that was I a have... warning. That was a warning to me. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't read them all yet, so um, you'd be spoiling me too, but um, I have a feeling, you don't have to comment on this, but I have a feeling Kiska is going to show up again, um, and possibly Temper too, I don't know, but um, maybe he seems like he's happy at the end to be staying where he is uh, on Malaz, uh, so, <laughs> but Kiska, I have a feeling she's got a career that we're going to want to watch here, so, um, so, you know, um, any other points you want to touch on, AP? Well, yeah, sorry, it was while you were talking there, because you'd said we were going to be doing a close reading, I was like, very yeah. quickly having a look. <laughs> to remind <laughs> I know that. Because I was prepared, <laughs> I was prepared for this in that I had read the book and, you know, done all of that. I wasn't waiting until this morning to finish, and therefore it's all fresh in my mind. You yeah. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> there's this practical reason why I waited until this morning to finish. So <laughs> keeping it all fresh in here, yeah. Um, but before we before we, we we get on to doing that sort of thing, yeah. um, I wanted to talk about you know, some of the some of the elements to this because obviously like, there's a uh, an exploration, even though uh, this is such a tight novel. There's actually an ex. Uh, exploration and explanation of a lot of the magic of the Malazan world, which, you know, people uh, have had difficulty wrapping their heads around because yeah. uh, particularly in the modern day, we're so tied up in discussions of, is it a hard magic system or a soft magic system? And why isn't everything explained to me in detailed appendices that list all of the rules? And um, so Cam, uh, or Cameron, uh, dealing with uh, or talking about the the magic system, what what are you what would you like to get across, or what are you trying to get across about the the magic uh, the magic rather than the magic system, but the magic of the Malazan world? What is it that intrigues you, and, and what you're trying to show? Um, uh, and again, Steve might you know have a, a different. Well, he will have a different take, uh, okay. but. Uh, for, for me and for him as well, uh, it, I think people want to th should should dispense with the uh, mechanism, uh, the mechanical approach to magic. They shouldn't take a, um, a sort of D and D system approach to to magic. In at least in our world, what what we wanted to explore was magic as power. Mm. Okay, so 
it's it's something that you can grasp and and all that you can make of it is well what does someone what can someone make of power and so it's it's on that sort of an idea of you granted access uh and then what you make of it is up to you yeah, which is obviously very f uh, familiar to anyone who's who's read tolkien because a lot of what tolkien did with magic is magic as this ineffable power that yes there are ways to shape it but ultimately magic is power in Tolkien's world. And there's a difference here too. I think magic is more common in the Malazan world. In fact, it is a bit of an equalizer, is it not in, in many respects, which is I think uh, something you guys did deliberately if I'm understanding that correctly. Yeah, it's one of the, the <clears throat> we, uh, um, it doesn't feature so strongly in Knives. Uh, it's, it's there, but uh, we wanted to portray a world that uh, was pretty much feminist, that uh, yeah. was gender e equal. Uh, so you might have a, a, a criticism of a character, but it's not based on their gender. It would just be based on their skills or their attitude or their, you know, and so, um, and again, po um, power or magic, uh, men and women, everyone has equal access to that. Yeah. And it's, it's just up to them. And I think that's actually something that, um, I, Cameron, do you remember about, must have been about 12 years ago. I know you weren't at ICFA that year, but I've talked to you about it. The very first, one of the very first papers I gave at ICFA had to do with uh, the Malazan world of the feminist. And I gave this whole paper based on, because the magic is available to everyone, anyone in the Malazan world can learn magic. There will always be people who have a talent for it, but anyone has the opportunity to. Like, and, like music. Yeah. Or Kiska, for example, in, in Night of Knives. Kiska it has some talent. She, for whatever reason, her own personality, her stubbornness, whatever, she refused a gala's, is that how you say the name, a gala? A gala. Uh, yeah, she refused her mentoring. Um, she wanted to forge her own path, uh, <laughs> so to speak. I don't know if she eventually does learn to use her talents or not, but it's an, an interesting aspect of this, yeah. And yeah. what, I'm, what I'm I love- sorry, AP, oh. AP, I'm sorry, I didn't want, mean to cut you off there. I just wanted to throw that in as a, a, an analogy, uh, yeah. music being this, or something that's available to anyone, and yet we're not all professional musicians. So. Yeah, and, and that was always how I thought about it. And one of the things that I really appreciated about Night of Knives is, and the reason I was, I was actually telling this anecdote was um, I, had, I had put that essay up on an old blog site that I had had. And all of this criticism I got was, I believe the author is overstating the availability of magic in the Malazan world. Uh -huh. um, there are only adepts or people who are talented, you know, and there was all of this criticism. And one of the things I loved about Night of Knives is in this edition that I have, and I'll just, I'll flip through because I bookmarked it on page 37, Temper says, touched common slang for anyone who knew the Warrens, the skill to access them could be taught, but it was much more common for someone to just be born with it, the talent. And so you explicitly put in Night of Knives the, the evidence that I needed uh, to defend <laughs> myself when I had suggested that, yeah, people could learn this, but you, you would have to find a teacher and if you think of, and this is one of the things I love about the psychology of the Malazan world. Mm. If you are a practitioner of magic and magic is par, would you really want to train a rival? And so finding someone to teach you is not as easy as we might think, because if you have all of this par, and someone goes, oh, I want you to teach me. And you'd go, well, I don't know you. Why would I teach you? You're just some random person. I have all of this power. You want some of my power? No. And there's this wonderful uh, complexity of psychology of, yes, it is technically available, but it's going to be dependent on finding a teacher, being able to afford to pay the teacher or find someone who will do it for free, uh, your own aptitude your own willingness to study for a while. And then over the course of, of 
um, any of the other books, magic is dangerous. And we see that in Night of Knives. Magic is not without cost. Magic is not without peril. And so, yeah, I, I'll learn how to play it, but it, it's not the same as learning to play the guitar and going, oh, sometimes my fingers bleed. It's, yes, I'm <laughs> going to learn how to access magic and sometimes my head will explode. <laughs> <laughs> or you might get sucked in and disappear. <laughs> yeah, slightly more dangerous than calluses on your fingertips. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, but I, you, I, I, and as we see in Knives, uh, you can uh, cheat as well. You can steal it from, uh, as... Uh, we, we learn in Knives that uh, Wu was, uh, took some shortcuts. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that, that poor guy whose research he stole. Yeah, Oleg's. Yes, that's terrible. How could he be so deceptive? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and again, it, it's little details like that because while we see um, Kellum Vett in this, Again, he's not a point of view character. Right. We, we, we keep seeing him from a distance and we hear about him. And everything we hear about him is, is not only consistent with this character that you've created, it's consistent across all of the books of this slightly mad, slightly uh, untrustworthy, power hungry, but not necessarily um, controlling kind of character who's just you know slightly insane and you don't know whether to like him or go, He's the most dangerous thing on the planet. Yeah. But I found him in Night of Knives. I, I agree with everything you just said, AP, in terms of his, he's eccentric. He is, you know, on some level, I, I find the character quite likable. But in Night of Knives, you really get the sense that this guy is creepy too. I mean, he's dangerous. He is a dangerous, deceptive little fella. And you better watch out. I mean, the level of fear that the more mortal characters exhibit in his presence just is a, is a tip off. I mean, watch out, this guy is dangerous. And so is his uh, partner, of course, dancer. So uh, I really loved that aspect of it. And what, this is something I've seen consistently in the Malazan books is you give us these great perspectives, these, these mortal ordinary people, while not ordinary, but Kiska and um, Temper are both characters that are easier for us to relate to. And their experiences, their horror, and their, you know, uh, getting mixed up with all these greater powers was the perfect narrative choice for, for this. Uh, so nicely done. But I also love the humor in here. I mentioned before how funny I thought it was that you had Kiska and Temper sort of meeting, not really meeting in her thinking he was a monster. The dialogue in here, some of the relationships are just so well done. I, you know who I loved as a pairing? I loved the, the exchanges between Lubin and uh, Temper. Is that the name, Lubin? The, the gatekeeper guy, yeah. I thought in, in my mind I heard Lubin, but. Okay, Lubin, okay, yeah, Lubin. And I'm gonna say Lubin then, uh, but. <laughs> I loved the uh, exchange. There was one time, they're always insulting each other. Like they're old veterans, you know, they, they get it. There's so much that they don't even need to say. They understand each other. But I love it when they insult each other. Like uh, when Lubin calls, uh, Temper has just emerged from his like the worst battle ever. And he's wearing this archaic armor and he's just absolutely a mess. And Lubin says, you, you look like a Tlanamas reject. <laughs> I just, is, I think but isn't I that the point it. I know but isn't that the point when then temper go he can smell the wine in the air because Lupin's just been drinking oh yeah oh yeah 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 the night watchman yeah I, I'm not getting involved in all of that crap going on out there there's supernatural yeah. events there's assassins there's monsters bugger that here's my getting my drink and going to bed <laughs> Yeah. yeah, he's a great character, uh, but it's you guys do these things so well. I love how you, you you have these relationships between the characters, the dialogue between them, just beautiful stuff. I mean, this is, I, I can't say enough how much I enjoyed that aspect of this. And it's a good thing it's there because if these comical moments were there, I, it, it's, it's terrifying. I mean, some of the stuff that happens in here is absolutely... Um, breathtaking and it's a short book but it, it has a scale to it 
like that opening scene, which we're going to break down now that AP's read it uh, again, uh, that is really epic, brilliant, big stuff too in there. So, and it's scary. So the humor is just, you know, it comes at the right times and it makes the book that much better. Yeah, I think that you have to um, clear the palette, so to speak. You have to move from, you can't have too much of one tone and you need to uh, then, yeah. then vary it and uh, keep, keep, keep the uh, moods uh, up and down uh, to, to keep the interest going, I think. If it's too much of one thing, it gets repetitive and, and, and boring. Yeah. Um, so the, the opening scene is, um, I think it's, it's, it was meant to be just a, a vignette that, that shows you that there's actually way more stuff going on off stage right now. Yeah. Right, and that's yeah, so sort of let the reader know that you're looking on the, the at the island right now, but just know that there's a lot of other stuff going on. <laughs> it's just looming throughout. I mean, we might as well read it. I'll, I guess I'll read it, and um, we can take a close look at it because I just think it's so. I loved this, and I also loved the um, the next bit, a path within shadow, which is in the shadow realm where we're with Edgewalker. I thought that was just brilliantly set too. I was just having a hard time deciding which one to go with, but I thought, okay, let's just go with the very opening. So I'm just gonna read the first two paragraphs here. Are we ready? Yeah. So the two-masted raider Rennie's dream raced Northeast under full straining sails. You hear that alliteration in there already? This is good stuff. Captain Merle gripped the stern railing and watched the storm close upon his ship. Pushed to its limit, the hull groaned ominously while the ropes skirled high notes Merle had never heard. There's some nice assonance in there too. Skirled and Merle, I love it. Okay, uh, the storm, this is the second paragraph. The storm had swelled like a wall of night out of the south a solid front of billowing black clouds over wind-lashed waves. But it was not the storm that worried Captain Merle, no matter how unnatural its rising. Rennie's dream had broached the highest seas known to Jakatan pilots from the northern sea of Kalt to the driving trade winds of the reach south of Stratum. No, what sank fingers of dread into his heart were the azure flashes glinting like shards of ice amid the waves at the base of the churning cloud front. No one told of seeing them this close, none who returned. I just, I love that last sentence in there, those three words after these longer descriptive sentences, you end it on this just boom, you nail it in there with that, that last sentence. Beautifully done. As I said, there's some alliteration in there. There's some assonance. I love how you drop all these names in that opening paragraph. I'm immediately put in this other world and I want to know, I want to know more. And there's this vast looming threat that is just coming here, right? That, that uh, really just sets the tone here. Great stuff. What did you think, AP? Well, you see, if, if you know anything about me and have watched any of the videos on my channel, you skipped out the bit that I would draw attention to first, which is Sea of Storms, south of Malaz Isle, season of a cirque, the 1154th year of Burns Sleep, which is the 96th year of the Malazan Empire, and the last year of Emperor Kalimved's reign. Yeah. And the reason, uh, one of the reasons why I always look at these sorts of epigraphs and this uh, top information before getting into a narrative analysis is I love when these are used well. And so in this, so the Sea of Storms, already we know that th this isn't, you know, the Pacific Ocean where it's it's pacified. This is the right. Sea of Storms. Like we're already getting a sense of not only the, the alliteration because Sea of Storms South, which by the way, given my accent, uh, is very difficult to say for this, Mike. <laughs> But so there's nice alliteration in that that opening line, which then with Malaz and you're emphasizing that sibilance and Al. So it all it all works very well, just as a, a nice rolling. Um, and then the season of Usark. So again, the sibilance is is carried on through all of this and mm. burn sleep. So uh, even in all of that, there is this this hissing noise going on at the start. But nice. Sea of storms. Um, so we're getting an idea that this is this is rough, wild all of those sorts of things, and south of Malaz Isle, 
So your signaling Malaz Isle is going to be a location of importance, mm. the season of Osirk. So that is setting this really much in, this is not spring, summer, uh, autumn or winter, that there's a different way of calculating time. So it's emphasizing that this is fantastical. Then the 1154th year of burn sleep. So we have that comparison to the AD, BC or uh, before common era, BCE, whatever way we're looking at it. But as Erickson pointed out recently, burn sleep is BS. <laughs> <laughs> I had to Mr. think. Mr. Esselmont, Mr. Esselmont, before we carry on uh -oh. with this exercise, <laughs> what is your comment on the fact that the entire dating system is actually BS? Because so is ours. <laughs> Fair enough. No one even knows when that shift takes place between AD and BC. No, no one knows what year that was. And then common era as well is uh, when I was living in Thailand, um, we had to use three different dates. Yeah, because there was the Western calendar for things or we or there was the uh, Chinese calendar for things, or there was the Thai Buddhist calendar for things. And and so to pretend that time and or, or we have a grasp of this even now is, is ridiculous. Uh, plus, uh, burn sleep is a reference to a tribal conceit, the, the, who believed that at that particular place, this goddess is, is buried and, and is sleeping. Uh, and they disagree over just when that happened, so. <laughs> It's so, BS. <laughs> and that's, I, I, I love now being able to, to point that out, seeing as I got corrected by your compatriot in a comment. Like, people think that when I do analysis and stuff, that like you and, and Steve email me and go, here, AP, you should really talk about this thing, and here's a breakdown of it, and this is what you want me to, uh, you want me to do. And I go... <laughs> That's not how this happens. I do this stuff. I put up a video. And the next thing I know, one of you chuckle brothers sends me a note going, you know, you're completely wrong. <laughs> so to just to carry on with this, the 96th year of the Malazan Empire and the last year of Emperor Kelmved's reign. So although there's not an explicit link between the creation of the empire and Kelmved in that, grouping, uh, Malaz Island, Malazan Empire, and it's focused on this is the last year of Emperor Kalimved's reign. So there's a lot of foreshadowing in just the, just the listing of the dates. The dates are giving you a location. They're giving you a geopolitical sort of area that we're going to be looking at. They're signaling that this is a portentous year. That's backed up by the fact that it's the Sea of Storms. So this idea of storm, change, power, all of that is tied up in that one little tiny epigraph of the dates. Mm -hmm. And I think one of my great frustrations is when I point things like this out in, uh, in a video I do or any sort of analysis I do, you'll always have someone say, oh, I think maybe he's overreading that or that wasn't, how can he know that that was intended or not intended? And I always come back to the fact that if, if it wasn't intended, it's remarkably consistent all the way through that this happens again and again and again. So either these two authors are the luckiest authors in the world that these things just happen to happen, or we can assume that it was intentional. So, so Cam. Most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear. Great answer. Great answer. <laughs> yeah. But what a lovely, lovely prologue, you know? I mean, that's just great stuff you have there. I mean, the billowing black clouds and the wind lashed waves. I mean, you set the tone. It's great stuff. What happens to the poor people on the, the Rennie's dream uh, is also very much uh, uh, 
foreshadowing, uh, shall we say. Uh, and that it comes up again in the book too. There's a moment when you have the fisherman who has successfully at great cost kept back this invasion, right? Uh, this, I'm, I'm not even sure what to call these, these, these riders, these storm riders. Uh, they're a pretty interesting group too. I, I have some questions about them, but, but yeah, they, the, this poor ship comes up one more time in, in, in the narrative when uh, the, the poor fisherman is trying to keep them back. And they finally beat him by bringing up this iceberg with this frozen ship inside it and he can't melt the ship. And so boom, you know, great stuff. Um, way to tie things together too, very nicely. So. so one of the things that I liked about the, the prologue as an opening is there's this evocation because it's, it's nautical. Yeah. Um, obviously the Malazan Empire, Malaz Island, we get a sense that it is a, a nautical empire, that it began as this sea empire. And of course, given my geographical location, I would immediately be making connections to the British Empire. Um, very small island that in terms of world affairs, had this huge influence that far exceeded its small geographical boundaries because of its navy, because of its expansionist uh, past. But the tone of all of this was of the, the horrific horror stories of uh, the, the supernatural elements of the navy and the, and the stories of these sailors at sea, these folk, dark folkloric elements which foreshadow then for me a lot of the horror tone and elements that you work into it. Hmm. And that is in combination with those fantastical elements. So we get this blend of what we're expecting of fantasy, of epic fantasy or whatever subgenre we're gonna place it in. But it is clearly signaling all of these, these horror elements because it's the night of knives. So we already have that darkness setting. We have these strange supernatural storm riders. We have the ship frozen at sea. And, you know, we can even recall in Dracula, um, Dracula taking over the ship and the guy lashed to the, uh, the, the <laughs> wheel to, to direct it to shore. Like all of these sorts of stories of the ghost I, I was ship. thinking of uh, the end of Frankenstein as well. Uh-huh. Oh, up in, yeah, in, in Antarctica, right? In the yeah. Arctic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Sorry, fine. Dark, so I yeah. picked the wrong classic one to go with, Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, was he being a critic? It's hard. <laughs> the critic of the well, critic. I'm, so again, the, the this epic, right? Uh, you know, very very problematic for for, for Steve and I. Uh, and and we're um. While you say that this is happening, yet in the book and and and, and again and elsewhere in, in the world. These uh, things happen that the reader, um, I'm thinking who's, who's um, been taught how to read fantasy in a certain way, expects that to be the central element, the, the epic ad, uh, adventure. And, and yet in Knives, um, no one realizes what happened. Uh, it's only a few people in the know realize what sort of a terrible thing had been dodged. And, and so the, again, the, this epic is undercut because no one even kn knows that uh, it, or is aware that it happened. That's a great thing here too. The levels of knowledge, you have our POV characters who really are fairly ignorant about the bigger things going on, don't even know what's going on in each other's parts of the story. And then you have the characters are definitely who are more in the know, such as Kellen Ved and Dancer. But even there, you get a sense that there are levels that they don't know. For example, you have this fellow edge walker, right? Who has been around. Uh, we don't even know how long he's been around, but he's been in this realm of shadow for quite a while. He's seen the Kellen Veds of the world come and go. There's, there's the one guy we meet in the, um, the second part. Is it, is it part of the prologue? The, the port, oh no, it's chapters in a, no. Well, anyway, it's the Jedel. Is that how you say his name, Jedel? The, 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 the chitinous guy with the um, in, insect-like appearance who's been, he had been a ruler of the shadow realm at one point or other, we don't know how long ago. Or a portion of it, yeah. Yeah, or a portion of it. And he's now imprisoned by his successor, presumably. Um, and every time he tries to call upon his power, he gets zapped, 
right? Uh, <laughs> he's in, he's in kind of a, 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 a bug trap there uh, of a sort. And, <laughs> and one of the, one of the things that I find like absolutely fascinating about this is it's very evocative of Greek mythology. If you think of Prometheus's yeah. uh, punishment. Yeah. So for me in reading that sequence, that was like Prometheus being chained to the rock and uh, being tortured every single day. And this is, is one of the things that I loved about this novel. So we have a horror element. We have Kelmved and Dancer, their story that they are pursuing. And that is so important to them about the, the realm of shadow. We have Edgewalker looking at it from a completely different perspective and going, well, you know, regardless of what happens, what well, they'll be around for a couple of millennia, but then we'll just go back to normal. We have Lucine's perspective where yes. she's very focused on the mundane empire. We have Temper and Kiska are sort of going, what's going on on Malaz Island? Like our friends are being attacked and you know, Temper's focused on these bridge burners who have turned up. Kiska's very focused on, she doesn't want to get left behind and it's a personal story. And yeah. almost all of them are completely and utterly unaware of the danger of the Storm Riders, which is the preoccupation of Aguila and- um, oh, the fishermen. Yeah. Right. And, and, so, and, 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 and so in this, think of all of those different stories, all of them, all these different narratives that exactly. in, in the hands of a, of a different author, in the hands of a, of a different series, yeah. one of those would have been, well, this is the story of this book. But here we have, these are events that are happening. It is the same event, but because of the, the subjective perspective, because of limited understanding of these things and because each character has their own set of priorities the story they would tell of that night is going to be radically different than the story that anyone else would tell and yet all of it is entirely consistent with characterization with their placement in the world and you know that this is why i keep coming back to these books as as being brilliant yep agreed Yep. Do you want to respond to that? Ah, uh, well, thank you. Um, I think that um, one of the I hope worries was that it, you know, I, I wanted people to have enough, you know, but not too little and not too much. And that's, that's a hard edge to stay on. You know, I might have fallen off here and there, uh, but um, I hope to have provided enough of a taste, if you will, of, of what Steve and I knew was to come, like that hadn't even been printed yet uh, and, or seen publication. But I wanted to give hints about, you know, don't worry about it. Just stick with us and uh, we'll, uh, it'll be a, a good ride. I'm happy to say you were very successful in that regard. And there are characters that I have met before as well that I have gotten a new look at. And AP, I have to bring this up, Tayshren. That okay. rat bastard. Ah, see, now I believe that this is a character that, okay, so I guess spoilers for Gardens of the Moon, uh, if you haven't read that, um, but you don't like Tayshren much in Gardens of the Moon. I, I know AP doesn't. <laughs> um, and later on, again, okay, so spoilers, we've talked about Memories of Ice. Um, he, you get a different glimpse of him and he does some things that are actually kind of noble in there. I've also read about him in uh, your other series, but here in Night of Knives, I felt this was a character I was more sympathetic towards. I liked Tayshren in here. He was kind to Kiska. He, you know, he was clearly in a place he didn't want to be in between Kellen Vetted Dancer on the one hand and Surly on the other hand. And he's like, you know what? I think I just want to sit this out. <laughs> And at the same time, when he was asked to help save the island, save the people on the island, he gave, even though he was exhausted. So AP, I want to ask you, and then I, I want to get Cameron's take as well. Do you like Tayshren a little more now? No, can't stand him. <laughs> the, the, the issue that Tayshren is always going to have for me is the very first time I encountered him was yeah. Gardens of the Moon. And from that, you go, first impressions can leave a lasting impression. And you go, yeah, he's a rap bastard and I don't like him. 
And uh, Cameron and I have, have discussed this at various points in that it, I find it very difficult to surmount that. And that is my problem. That's because I have built this image up in my <laughs> head that is not based on the available information. It is only based on that one first impression. And every time we talk about it, Taishrin is an absolutely fascinating, complex character. Yeah. And I joke about not liking him, but he is in this. It's not necessarily that he is kind to Kiska. I think he had a choice. He could just have her killed or hmm, maybe she might be useful. Now, because we're with Kiska's perspective, she may choose to view that in terms of of, of kindness, of uh, giving her a break, or she's looking at it because she has this ambition. Here's her chance. Ah, oh, take me with you. And right. you know she's she's aware of the peril. But I think for for Tayshren, he is incredible. He comes across as incredibly intelligent here. The yeah. the, the conflict between calculating. Uh, yes. Okay, fine. Calculating. Uh, no, I'm I'm adding. I am not <laughs> Although, if, if while well, you're going, getting interrupted, I would just say too that there's a third alternative in regard to Tatrin, which is that he is both calculating. Ah, Kiska, yes, she can be useful and being kind. I think you can actually kind of have both there, I would say. Well, maybe you can, but I hit the rat bastard. So, um, <laughs> um th again, this is one of the things that um, Steve and I uh, are looking at the genre and saying uh well actually there are no villains hmm. you know if if everything is shades of gray then there are no absolute villains and, and no absolute heroes uh and, and Tayshrin is, is a very nice case for this um when we first meet him in gardens he is the classic villain he is set up to be the bad guy uh and and so um it's almost a deliberate effort to try and undermine and turn that yeah and and if i or steve can have a reader dislike someone at the beginning of a narrative and manage to bring them around by the end of the narrative and have them uh, if not like at least admire or understand that yeah. that character then that's a, a great achievement and uh, yeah well you guys do that all the time but some people are more stubborn than others <laughs> 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 Fine. <laughs> but what, what I really enjoyed about this was that Tayshrin had this clear, he was caught, as, as Philip said, caught between what Kelvin and Dancer were contending with Lucene. And it's clear Lucene or, or Surly is going, you know, control of the empire, I want to take over. And, yeah. and Kelvin and Dancer, are, they're not actually contesting that. And this is something that I think Lucene doesn't see and that we see that Kelvin and Dancer are actually there for a completely different reason. And Lucene doesn't see it. Um, mm. But Tayshrin just doesn't want to get involved. And he doesn't want to piss off the people he has sworn loyalty to and served, a Kelvin and Dancer. But at the same time, Lucene's kind of dangerous. And does what if she wins? I, I don't want to piss off the new person who might be in charge, yeah. but she's my contemporary. And we have that great scene after Kelvin and Dancer have died. And it's Lucene talking to Tayshrin and there's a tatter on the ground, but he's standing there and he's unafraid. Mm -hmm. And that for me, for a mage character to be standing there and going, no, but Lucene, basically, I'm not afraid of you because you need me. I'm, I'm this powerful and, and I, I'm going to be useful in what's going forward. Yeah, I have no power right this second because of the Atateral, but I know my place in all of this and I will swear loyalty and you know I'll serve you just as faithfully as I did Callum Vett and Dancer because I'm not interested in the throne. And I thought that was such a fascinating scene and it may be that uh, Cameron, that you'd, you'd intended a different reading of that, but that's what I took away from it. Hmm. No, I'd say that's pretty, pretty good. Uh, um, each of them, the only reason that they get along is that they understand each other's place and uh, don't overstep 
<clears throat> their boundaries. Uh, and so it's, a, it's an understanding. Um, and yeah, Kel Kelvin and they're, they're, they're not interested in ruling because it's just too much hard work. Right. It's, 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 <laughs> they really can't be bothered to do all that boring paperwork. <laughs> I keep comparing Kellenved to Faust. I think I see him as a Faustian character mm -hmm. who's, you know, okay, I learned medicine, you know, enough of that. I learned philosophy, that's for bores. You know, I learned, you know, that's, and then he's, he wants magic, you know, he wants power, he wants knowledge. So I, I see Kellenved in that light. And I'm wondering though, does Surly know that they're trying to ascend or does she find out at some point because you do have the claw turn up at the dead house in the, in the crazy scene there. Um, it, it seems that she does try to prevent them from ascending. Is that, is that correct? Or am I misreading something? Um, I think she's trying to limit their um, influence. Okay. And trying, you know, not letting them get a free hand. And uh, because she, I think she's certainly worried that they might get too much. Uh, and uh, yeah. Be, be, be more of a threat than she can contain. Yeah, that could be a problem because they might start messing around with the empire. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, I have to say, like the, the dead house, the, the Azath house, um, I, unfortunately, this is one of those things that I, I really wish that we could do a whole video where I get uh, you and Steve on and we actually talk about all of these great mysteries of the Malazan world right, right, that right, only right, ever yeah. hinted at. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but not explored. But the Azath, I think, have to remain a bit of a mystery. But uh, one of the things that I find fascinating about it is this is so creepy. The the horror element here of the, the roots coming up and snagging temper. The, oh, yeah. uh, the undead hands coming up out of the it was like Michael Jackson's thriller video with all of the fake mist, all of the, the dancing zombies. Like, uh, but much scarier. And then added to that, the hounds of shadow running around. Oh, yeah. That there, the elements of horror in this were playing with, uh, again, tropes of horror or things that people would maybe consider cliches of horror but they were genuinely creepy and genuinely sinister. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Cameron, like, what were you thinking going, yes, you know what this fantasy novel needs? I know, uh, a whole scene basically in a creepy supernatural graveyard. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can't answer um, every mystery to the surrounding the Azath. Uh, but if you think about the prevalence of access to power in the world, how um, people can, can uh, potentially amass so, so very much, uh, and that there has to be some sort of a counterbalance, yeah. which is the crystallization of that power, the, uh, the gathering together and the reburying uh, of, of that power. And so we have two sides of this equation going on, a, a sort of a balancing act. There's also, I think, an important clue in here when Temper is basically placed in the role of the guardian and he's got to keep Jenna, the, the jagged, I assume she was at some kind of jagged tyrant at some point or other. He's got to prevent her from exiting the Azath. And at some point he enters her, he enters Omto's Falak. He enters that realm with her. And at that point, the Azath isn't a house any longer. It's more of a grave. It's more of a mound, if I'm remembering this correctly. A tomb. A tomb, exactly. So the form that it takes uh, would seem to have more to do with the particular period where we happen to be. Its function remains the same, I assume, whether it's the tomb uh, that we're seeing, facade that we're seeing, or the house, or what have you that this is an ancient entity that goes back way, way, way before. And as you say, um, something to do with when great power uh, comes along, it's a response to that. Uh, it is something about keeping balance, uh, maybe a, a kind of a, a just a, not even necessarily sentient uh, force that, uh, I, well, I'm just guessing, I'm conjecturing here. So. 
but but very nice. And it, it, I was talking before about levels, about how you have the mortal characters who don't know as much as those who are proficient in magic and have been around a few hundred years. And then there are characters who've been around for millennia, you know, the, the edge walkers of the world. And then you have the Azath. And I think the Azath is probably, as far as I can tell, the end of the line here, perhaps. Um, so. I think so for me anyway. Um, uh, uh, we, you know, we, we look at, today, we, we look at tombs, we look at standing stones, we look at these remnants, these ruins, and we wonder, we think we can build theories for what they were and what they meant to the people at the time, but we can never really know. Yeah. We can put forward hypotheses and structure our fancy ideas about their ritualistic purposes, et cetera, et cetera. But really, we can't be certain what the attitudes were of the people who were raising those artifacts. Yeah. Even if Professor Drysdust claims that he does know. <laughs> well, you, you can tell Cameron has archaeological training because the first thing he went to was, well, there was obviously a ritual purpose that we can't divine. It's like That's archaeologists, right. when they find like anything, joke. oh, this must have been a ritual. <laughs> uh. <laughs> but um, I want to talk a bit about uh, temper. And again, this is, this is one of those clever things that I think that you work into uh, the novel, which is because we are with temper as a point of view character and we get a lot of his internal thoughts and we get those analeptic sequences, those flashbacks to when he was serving um, with Dasim and was yeah. part of the sword. And Temper is so humble about his position within the sword that he, he regarded the others as greater than him, that he was, he, he seems to come across as thinking that he was the weak link. And yet we get these moments where we see him from external perspectives and people are in awe of him. And it's, it was this wonderful moment for me because it's the, he felt that pretender syndrome, that yeah. doubting of oneself that uh, I don't know about you guys, but I suffer from in that I, I, I constantly feel that I'm underqualified to discuss absolutely anything. And to see that in, in a character where, you know, we can see as reader that he is clearly really, really proficient, but it is so persuasive early on that we think that maybe he, he was the weakling, but we see over the course of it that this is just his own psychology that has infected the, the narrative. And when he faces off against uh, Jenna, against the tyrant or, or against the Jaga, yeah. we see this come to the fore and the, the shock and awe of those that have witnessed what yeah. he has done. The fact that he stood even for a brief time against a hound of shadow that these are feats that although he is mortal, although he is one of the little people, that he is an exceptional individual. And yet because he walked beside Dasim, he always regarded himself as inferior. And I, I just thought this was, to see that never explicitly stated, that we're never told, oh, and this is how he felt. But all of that comes across in how he tells his story, how he perceives the world, yeah. how others see him. Like we see that. It's this show don't tell mentality of your writing. And uh, yeah. that was just one example of it that I thought was really well done. I got to agree just quickly and just say, it's even reflected in his name, which has a double meaning. You know, I, at first I thought it meant, okay, he has a temper, he has a t he's an angry guy. But you learn later on that it actually, no, it, it can refer, it does refer to his role in the sword. I mean, a temper as in the sword being tempered. So I like that too. So what AP was saying really fits because, you know, there's temper as in he has a nasty temper and that would be the, the, the less flattering view he might have of himself. But then there's the other meaning of his name, which we see when he stands like a wall and kind of saves the day. So uh, it's, it's great stuff. Um, I think that um, another thing uh, we were uh, wanting to get across are, are the, is, is the consequences of the uh, of 
violence. Uh -huh. And he's a, he's a wounded man, uh, psychologically and emotionally, and is suffering from survivor guilt. Because uh, all of his friends have died, uh, and it's, uh, it's very, he's very wounded by this. So, um, and so we wanted to, instead of showing um, adventure and violence, with uh, we, we have to have the consequences. We have yeah. to show how this wounds and harms people, and and scars them psychically. So he's uh, and what's one of the things being portrayed here with the temple. Hmm. Um. But it's like, even as a, a little superficial thing, I love the way that each member of the sword had that sort of title, that name that was given to them to, yeah. to form an actual sword uh, yeah. with, with Dasim at the center. Uh, and it just, it was one of those little tiny touches mm. that is the thing that makes, um, when we talk about world building, people sometimes have this idea that it's all about the generation of the physical setting. But for me, world building is, goes far beyond that because it's about creating a reality. And little tiny touches like that are the things that make it come alive, that it feels authentic, that these soldiers serving, he subsumed his own name, his, his own sort of uh, personality and individuality to serve as part of Dasim's sword. And he takes that on as a name, as uh, as a role, and uh, is proud of that because this is this is something he aspired to, and he was honoured to have taken on. And yet, that is now sort of followed him. Um, so uh, there's an interesting, very complex psychology to it, but also this uh, wonderful use of tiny details to make the world feel far more alive mm -hmm. than if things just were assigned and it, it felt artificial, this is worked into it. Yeah. And the, the backstory built in there with the flashbacks and the fact that we don't know, we share tempers, um, the ambiguity in whether or not Dasim is alive or not. Uh, I think that's, that's fantastic. And the survivor's guilt, which you mentioned um, and everything else, uh, really compelling character. He and Kiska both. I, I just I enjoyed meeting these characters uh, immensely and uh, following the story with them. Well, there's there's one major thing that I, I sort of wanted to to bring up, and I, I know we've been going for a wee while now, and I'm conscious of everyone's time, but yeah. it was at the the very end of the book, the message from the Storm Riders of yeah. why are you killing us? Yeah, that this upends all of this thing and this is again it goes back to to this element of perspective about trying to figure out what's going on about in fantasy we have these set ideas about this is the trajectory of the story and yet everything in this novel a lot of the stuff in the Malazan universe is about no the story is going to be dependent on your perspective hmm. and suddenly at the end to get that wounded dying Storm Rider looking up and said, why are you killing us? Yeah. When this, they had been this threat, this supernatural threat that had to be held at bay and everyone, the, these powerful sorcerers, mages were so worried about that um, they're so alien that we project so much into this about they must be the enemy. And it's not, it's, there's something else going on. And again, it, it's this lack of our understanding is creating the problem. Yeah, well said. And, and what is the grandfather's response? He slits its throat. And I thought, wow, okay, uh, that is heavy stuff. And just as you said, AP, it sort of flips everything right there. And you, 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 you start, to, okay, who is the aggressor here? Um, it, it's, a, it's a chilling moment, actually, that ending. When you have this, you know, he's a kindly grandfather. He's going to check out the, the two grandkids thought they saw something that scared them. And he was going to go pretend that he's, and it's okay, kids. And he was, you know, he's just old fellow that we like. And, but then he, you get the last thing is his thought uh, of what he just did. And he slits its throat, which is, okay, I, does he know it's a storm rider? Or does he just see some creature that he thinks he, he sees as threatening? Um, 
You know, it's, it, what is it that's this human response of aggression toward that which we do not understand, you know? Um, and that is something very powerful there. And, the very, and you got me with that too. I, that I was not expecting, that last moment. And I'll add one more thing before I, we, can, we can get Cam, uh, Cameron to try and respond to this, which yeah. is it ends not only with the slitting of the throat, but that the storm rider's blood is warm and red. Yeah. And it's this point of connection that is so, if it had been black, if it had been green, if it had been blue, you know, it, it would have been that strange and alien and different. But this suddenly brings it home that no matter how strange they are, there's a point of connection. Yeah. And that to me is not only is there the shock about what the grandfather does, but then it's the, the further added shock of uh, are, are they, they're not as different as I thought. And it, it's this wonderful mystery that is set up. It's a, a, a wonderful question in the universe. But just bringing that home about even something that can appear alien, even something that can appear frightening, that stop looking at the differences, mm. start looking for points of connection. So, Cam, Storm Riders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, the, for the... The grandfather was a, it was a practical decision. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the blood, again, yes, um, perhaps we're all not so different <laughs> after all. Uh, and if, if they're being killed, you know, what we would have to wonder was, what is their goal? And their goal is something else. And, and uh, what is it? And that's sort of, one of the um, answers to come. Hmm. I don't well, know how much spoiler to give here, actually. Yeah. Well, 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 this is this the storm riders are something that are explored deeper into the series, so we will get to it at some point. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I think we'll we'll call it uh, a day here. Um, Cameron, is there anything you want to, to add at the end? Are you? Oh, well, I'd say you know, thank you guys so much. Uh, it's it's great to sit down and, and talk about it. Although it's been a while for me. To <laughs> well, <laughs> since, but I, see, the thing is, I would love to have started with the latest things and start working backwards, but that that becomes very very difficult to do when you sort of say, no, we'll start at the first book so people can now pick these up, they can read along with us as as we get to them. But that unfortunately means you have to reach back into the recesses of your mind. <laughs> To, to try and draw off all of this my, stuff for Off me. my very small little shelf. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's falling off of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I would just like to, before I let AP sign out, I would like to return the thanks. Thank you for writing these fantastic books. I am very excited to be delving into this series and finding out what happens with some of these characters and getting deeper into the Malazan world and uh, I just I thank you because I've been feeling very moved by the themes that you've put in these books too. So uh, just thank you, and and I, I hope we'll get to talk again. And this has been very illuminating for me. So wonderful. So uh, just to say thank you to both my guests, uh, Dr. Philip Chase and Mr. Ian C. Esselmont. Uh, this has been absolutely fantastic. I have enjoyed myself immensely. I always find this kind of discussion illuminating and fun. I hope everyone watching has enjoyed this along with me. And I will link to Philip's spoiler-free video in, uh, in the description below. And I hope you'll all pick up Night of Knives and we can have a discussion about it in the comments. But thank you guys. Thank you both for, for coming along. Thank you. And thanks for watching.